It is March 18, 2016. Uh, I'm in Fredericksburg, Virginia at the Friends of the Rappahannock. And uh, we are doing an oral history interview with Harold Wiggins uh, about the history of the Rappahannock. Uh, my name is Jess Riggelhout. Um, sitting to my left is Nancy Millwood, who may come in later and ask some questions. Um, but I'm going to begin by asking you if you could describe your earliest memories of the Rappahannock, which may well have preceded your work uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say um, I've been aware of the Rappahannock River since the uh, 1970s, but it wasn't until the mid-1980s that my family and I moved to Fredericksburg. And around 1985, my son James needed an Eagle Community Service Project. And we thought maybe we'd go down uh, and see that place at the bottom of the hill where they have canoes and talk about a, a nature trail. So we came down here, pretty close to where we are right now, and uh, walked the property. And we sat down on the ground, and, and a man came out and asked us what we were doing. That was Bill Mix. Okay, And Bill Mix, uh, who owns the Virginia Outdoor Center, uh, assisted us in um, uh, finding a, a trail project. It's a almost a one-mile loop called the Maves Trail. We named it after Rush Maves, uh, a man who's done a lot of walking and, and uh, uh, a lot of memories of uh, the mid-Atlantic here and trails he's walked all over. So we named it after Rush. <clears throat> so that was my, my first contact um, with the Friends of Rappahannock through Bill Mix. Um, my work uh, that began in the early 90s with Corps of Engineers um, somehow got intrinsically connected to the Rappahannock River through the Friends of Rappahannock. Uh, in 1993, I believe, John Tippett and I, one of the former directors of FOR, we, we um, got the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries involved in talking about the removal of the Embry Dam. Uh, the Embry Dam, uh, built in 1910, uh, is impediment to fish and recreation and uh, this seemed like a, a project that, that could have great benefits to the Rappahannock River and the region. Um, but 1993 began a long conversation <laughs> with various uh, interest groups and agencies. Um, my work with Corps of Engineers, I'm regulatory, I don't remove dams, but my agency did get involved in the mid-90s with a project to remove the Embry Dam, and ultimately it was breached in, in 2004 and removed in 2005. Could you tell me a little bit about how it looked different right around here when you said you came down here around 1985? Uh, what would someone have seen walking around that would look different than it does right now? Well, the, the main change has been the replacement of the Fall Hill Bridge and the trees along Fall Hill Avenue. Um, but beyond that, towards the river, there hasn't been much change. The Maves Trail has led to more public awareness of uh, the river and, and a lot of the people who'd stay overnight and break glass and leave trash, that got cleaned up. I guess the, aware, the awareness with the Friends of Rappahannock doing their programs helped create a, a, a more public awareness uh, situation here. So that was a, a, a change, but it came gradually. Uh, but when I first came here in 85, it was just the woods, this building. Uh, there was many more trees along Fall Hill Avenue here. Um, and, but uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of change right here. How would it have looked different walking from here up to where the Embry Dam was at that point and maybe even walking you know, a mile past it? Well, the Rappahannock River above Embry Dam was a lake, okay? Um, it was a large body of water that uh, had a, a cascade going over the dam, um, that changed in 2004 to become a river along that one mile segment of where the uh, Embry Dam was. But um, I wouldn't say that physically there's been much change beyond the removal of the dam going up towards um, the upper reaches of the FOR property. When you say it was a lake, how wide was it? Did it affect the properties on both sides? Or? Yeah, um, the the dam uh, itself was over a thousand feet long, 
Um, and then another half a 0.7 miles of distance of backwater. Um, and you could essentially canoe right up to the edge of the dam in a canoe because the water was going over evenly over the entire stretch. Uh, the Embry Dam itself was considered historic and one of the things we had to pay attention to during the removal was preserving some part of its history. So the abutments were left on each side of the dam. You can see that now, which you couldn't see before. You really couldn't see it before the excavation. You can see that there was the Embry Dam and behind it the Crib Dam, which was a much earlier dam. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Anchorage, Alaska in 1953, Providence Hospital. And uh, when I was one year, one and a half, um, we came down the Alcan Highway. Um, Alaska wasn't a state when I was born. Alaska didn't become a state until 1959. So whenever we traveled out of the country, I always had to refer that I was a citizen of a territory of the United States. <laughs> I remember that. Um, and the, the American flag had 48 stars. You know, in columns, they weren't kind of like staggered. That's pretty cool when you tell kids that because a lot of kids think there's always been 50 states. And within our lifetime, we've, we've seen states added. Did you grow up in Alaska? No, I, I was uh, very young. We uh, left Alaska and my dad was in the military, so we lived in El Paso, Texas, Fort Bliss. And uh, when I was uh, 12, we moved to Panama Canal Zone. And for three years, I lived in Panama. And uh, I think that something about going from a dry, arid climate to a humid climate that was very lush and green changed my health. I, I was very, a very sick kid, but I got very accustomed to being in humid places and, uh, uh, and, and my love of the outdoors and going into the jungle and, and finding animals, that was a, a real uh, benefit to me as a kid. Uh, I joined the Boy Scouts. Um, I walked from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, the Chiba Chiba Trail when I was 13. Of course, it's only 45 miles, but with the Boy Scouts, we were able to, to hike and walk. Um, I met Darion Indians, used to be headhunters along the way. I remember that. But there was a lot of wonders as for a kid growing up to, to see a foreign country in a land like that. And, uh, in um, 1967, we moved uh, to Virginia, and I grew up in Northern Virginia. In, in the mid-80s, we, we uh, came here to Fredericksburg after I finished my education and my wife finished her education. So other than what sounds like a really fantastic hike, uh, are, there, are there experiences from your childhood that influenced your interest in science and the natural environment? Well, yeah. Um, I think that one of the things that got my my, my, my brain chogged into looking at science was when my older sister gave me a book on Charles Darwin. Living in Panama, I began to see animals and, and began to contemplate evolution. and um, I, That kind of stayed with me, that love of the outdoors. And uh, I have an artistic side of my nature and a, and a scientific side of my nature. Like most people, when I try to work on both of them and become a balanced person. That's my philosophy. But um, from an early age, um, I was very studious and able to apply myself when I got into uh, uh, college and ultimately I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in 1986 at uh, Old Dominion University. Are there experiences that you had with um, your parents that uh, influenced your interest in science and the outdoors? Um, well, just the fact that I was left at home a lot as a kid, before latchkey kids were known, and the fact that one of my favorite pastimes was getting up early Saturday morning and packing a lunch and heading out to the mountains and just walking and walking and exploring and going and finding new places. I remember walking up a ravine in, uh, up through the Franklin Mountains where we lived in El Paso. There was a, a bright, shiny gemstone lying in the, 
in the ravine, and it turned out to be a big chunk of quartz, faceted quartz. It got me thinking about, um, you know, how that could have happened, you know, and I began to go farther and farther in the mountains and found there were fossils, actually, in the rocks farther up. Um, it, it really just um, stimulated my imagination. Then to suddenly go from a desert mountainous environment to a, to a lush jungle riverine environment like Panama is um, evidence to me that there's places all over the world that have great variety. Um, and so that, that was a big influence on, on my love of, of nature and spending as much time in nature as I possibly can, when I can. <laughs> what were some of the best experiences you had in Panama? Well, uh, there was an abandoned concrete factory out in the jungle, and we'd leave the perimeter of the base and walk and walk and walk and find this, this, this ghost-like um, series of buildings and finding pythons and spider monkeys and marmosets and kuda mundays and three-toed sloths and fertile ant snakes. The place was alive, and we would spend as much time as we can just just seeing animals, most of them were too big to capture and want to keep. But I can remember clearly seeing pythons and um, Kuta Monday are like these uh, raccoon-like creatures that have a corollary in our uh, world of you know sneaking around the garbage cans. We had the same problem in Panama. But in our front yard, we had a sloth hanging out of a tree and um, snakes everywhere. I mean, you know, and many of them were poisonous. You know, the bushmaster, the fertile ants, um, just bad news. But uh, uh, but but you learn you you learn to keep um, uh, you know a, a healthy respect for for nature and um, let animals go along their way. Uh, there most animals are not there to hurt you. You know they're more afraid of us than we of them. And uh, but the, but the color the vibrancy seeing turtles I remember seeing turtles and and uh, the creeks and um, just um, hearing the sounds at night birds bird calls waking up in the morning, late in the afternoon. Our, our home didn't have glass windows, we had screens. There was no such thing as air conditioning living in Panama, we didn't have that luxury. There was two seasons, rainy and dry. And uh, when it rained and rained and rained, often creatures would be washed out of the jungle and down the street. I mean, it was pretty wild. Um, so constantly being aware there are creatures in, in hidden places all around where you live. Um, stimulated my mind as a young person. What were some of your favorite subjects in school while you were in Panama? Well, it would have to be art. It would have to be biology and art, uh, the study of living things. Um, I didn't do real well in math, but um, I could memorize the names of plants I always wanted to be a botanist, and in my professional life, I've learned that being a botanist assists me in being a wetlands ecologist and preserve, you know, preserving wetlands and working to protect the environment. Um, but uh, mainly, um, getting out of school and playing, <laughs> hiking and canoeing, th those were the things that I really liked to do. So you were 14 when you got to Northern Virginia? Yes. Um, where did you go to high school? Well, uh, initially uh, Annandale High School. And I ran track, I ran cross country, and I wrestled. Um, my family moved to Fairfax. I spent a semester at Woodson High School. And ultimately I graduated uh, at Fairfax High School in 1972. Uh, that was a time when um, I saw the, um, the, the Vietnam War going full tilt and the end of the Vietnam War coming. Uh, the 60s, I went from a freshman year when nobody was allowed to have hair over their ears to the time I was a senior, you know, most of my friends had long hair and could still run track, could still do athletics. It was a pretty wild time, you know, to, to witness a change that fast. And uh, the generations were so divided, there was so much polarity between parents and kids, but um, I, I remained close to my family, and, um, but uh, had a lot of interesting experiences as a teenager growing up in Northern Virginia. What were some of the things that 
experiences or things that were changing that um, were particularly memorable? Well, the fact that um, the environment was changing. I, um, we didn't really have the environmental laws uh, at that time, like the Clean Water Act or uh, NEPA or any of the any of the anti-pollution laws. Just watching the rate of development. I remember as a kid seeing streams filled full of mud, you know, streams being uh, destroyed, uh, wetlands, uh, the, the loss of our environment. Um, we had a forest behind our house that was clear cut for development. Um, that you know, the rate of change, the you know the the, the the suburbanization of Northern Virginia in the 1960s was was quite a phenomenon. Watch the woods go real quick. I remember that. Um, George Mason University uh, used to be George Mason College, and the last big track of woods was behind uh, George Mason. And when I was a kid, I used to go back there and camp and build shelters and spin several nights at a time, but, but now it's the Patriot Center, you know, and it's the University of, Mer of, of George, George Mason. And the University of Mary Washington became, you know, from a college to university. Um, yeah, I, I, um, Fairfax was kind of the limits of, of civilization. You know, you, you went beyond that, it was this, the country. There's nothing, just nothing beyond Route 50 in Fairfax. But that all changed, and, and, and I began to see that change as I, as I got a little older. That, that was on my mind. One of the reasons we moved to Fredericksburg is there's still resources here that uh, are accessible and always a place you can escape and hike and see the water. Uh, it was a big reason why we came here from Fairfax. There were a number of events that affected the environmental movement mm -hmm. that while you were in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, Rivers caught on fire. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. What were some of the events that you remember uh, that became part of the national discourse, but that might have had an effect? Well, um, there was um, several um, planned rallies in Washington D.C. As a teenager, I remember uh, going to a couple of those. Um, there was uh, one that happened in 1970. That resulted in D.C. being closed down for three days. Um, you know, 50,000 kids camped in West Potomac Park um, you know, to protest the Vietnam War. Mainly, it was it was the, the Vietnam War that was driving a lot of the change. But of course, with that came the environmental movement. Uh, you know, rights between the sexes. You know, women's movement. Um, social change was happening so fast that you couldn't go anywhere without seeing some form of protest or, um, you know, idea that maybe it's time for a change. I remember as a kid driving to St. Louis and seeing smog that was so bad, uh, when the sun shone through it, it created this sulfurous yellow color. I remember that. It's unthinkable to, to see a city here in this country like that. I think you have to go to New Delhi or Beijing or one of those places to, to really see what it was like here before we had the um, anti-pollution laws come into effect in the late 60s and early 70s. It's interesting, back in the 1950s, um, a project came to this region called the Salem Church Dam. Uh, and I have the original document. The, the, the agency that I worked for, for almost 25 years, um, was a task to build a dam on the Rappahannock River that would have flooded 24 miles of river upstream, a mega, mega project. The Salem Church Dam um, picked up a lot of steam over the 1960s and almost got built, but it was defunded, okay, in 1974. There was a, a citizens group here, the, uh, the Rappahannock Defense Council, that fought the Salem Church Dam project. But at that time, uh, there really were no environmental laws that would make a federal agency like the Corps of Engineers study the environmental effects of building a dam on the Rappahannock. The, the document that I have rarely mentions the environment. In fact, there's a letter from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science that 
said, hey, it'd be a good idea. We'd keep fresh water in the upper reaches and help oysters. You know, that's how our thinking was back then before, you know, we really begin to apply the science to understand our actions and, and what our actions have on the environment on projects of that scale. Um, it's interesting that the Rappahannock Defense Council in the 1970s, many of the members helped create the Friends of the Rappahannock that came about in, in the 1980s. There's a direct link with the same people that gave birth to this, uh, this organization is a watchdog over the Rappahannock. Now you weren't here, but you know, either in your work or now being close to mm -hmm. uh, the Friends of the Rappahannock, did you get a sense that the Rappahannock Defense Council saw itself as part of a national environmental movement uh, to really defend waterways and, I mean, protect the national environment? I don't think that um, we have enough information about the Defense Council. I think they were more local. There was one fellow in particular, Randy Carter, who was a, a, an avid whitewater boater, who was fighting to preserve um, the, the scenic qualities and in particular the, the rapids that would be you know, flooded by this large lake that would be built here. Um, I got to meet the, the Carter family Later on, I, I wrote a book, uh, A Tale of Two Dams from the Salem Church to the Embry Dam. Uh, in my lifetime, I've seen this change from um, agencies like the Corps of Engineers destroying the environment, building dams, building seawalls without much uh, thought process put into studying the effects it would have on the environment, to an agency that's a task to remove dams, to restore the environment. Our, our values as a people nationally have changed, and nationally, you know, the, the political will of the people gave birth to these environmental laws that put agencies like the Corps of Engineers at task to assess its, its its undertakings on the environment, and that's a good thing. I mean, it's 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 been a long process of evolution, but when you think 30 years, that's all it is. 30 years, how much we've changed from wanting to build dams to now restoring the environment. The Corps doesn't build any dams anymore. They don't build dams, but there's Corps of Engineers dams all over the country that were built in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. But the rate of dam building began going down dramatically in the 1960s and 70s to the point where that's not what the Corps does anymore. Could you tell me about your... Um decision to attend uh, Old Dominion? And, um... Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good story because um, I was attending college at Northern Virginia Community College and um, I uh, had a biology professor named Walt Bulmer who every year would take students down to the Great Dismal Swamp in uh, Chesapeake, Suffolk counties. And I went on one of these and when I was in, in their vertebrate zoology class, I met professors from Old Dominion who told me I should be down there studying oceanography and marine science. So that I transferred uh, in the early 80s to, to Old Dominion. It was the right decision. Initially I wanted to be an oceanographer, but um, I found that I could be more useful locally if I became a wetlands consultant and ultimately become a wetlands regulator. And that's kind of the, the, the chain of sequence of events. Uh, the Great Dismal Swamp was, a, was a, just a petri dish for me to uh, discover that, you know, I, I uh, am in a position where um, people are needed who could understand wetlands and their values and protect them. And that's what I pursued. I had great mentors at Old Dominion that, that helped me uh, and find my way through life. And uh, that was really important because uh, many young people don't know where they're needed. And, how they can apply their love of a subject like nature, biology, to actually having an effect locally in their community. So I was lucky to have uh, a handful of professors that guided, guided me and, and helped me understand um, uh, my way and my path through life. Uh, in 2013, I co-published a book with one of my professors, Dr. Linton Musselman, who's a world-renowned botanist. but uh, 
I got up under his uh, coattails and we wrote a fascinating guide to wild edible plants, become very popular. Um, Lytton's written many books, but every time we'd go out paddling, and I would assist him in, in finding wetland, uh, rare plants in wetland marshes. Uh, we began talking about edible plants and, and those that haven't been published. We decided to publish original recipes, so we spent two years going out foraging and finding that most of the plants that purportedly were edible by the literature tender turn out to be not worth the effort. <laughs> we have a whole chapter on failures, but but we feel that well that's part of the search for knowledge, you know, going out and trying something and, and failing and reporting it, you know, but every now and then we find a great recipe, you know, a, a plant that uh, is 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 uh, available, widely available, easy to prepare and uh, we feel that we've written uh, an original book that actually has recipes and explains the toxicity of plants and uh, you know toxic look-alikes and plants that um, you know you you can identify easily and that it's kind of a survival book and then, uh, so um, I've continued a tradition with my professors a couple of them and in, uh, uh, in the 1990s I helped with the 23rd annual Dismal Swamp Symposium where we co-published a, a paper on uh, on the years of uh, vertebrate zoology and what we found and what were the trends with uh, animals during that period of time, which which is gratifying to to also find that you can publish, learning how to publish, learning um, that you have something worth uh, researching and, and publishing. I mean, I know it's <clears throat> probably hard to sum up and uh, a few years ago, but what were some of what was some of the thinking about wetlands and their yeah. role, particularly in this region, uh, mm -hmm. while you were in college? Well, when I was in college, um, the uh, Clean Water Act had really just gotten off the ground. Um, there was controversies with regulating wetlands because trying to define the upper limits, you know, how far do we go beyond the navigable waters, you know, beyond the perennial streams, uh, where is the limit? of boundary to protect the wetland, to draw a line in the sand. Um, I came into the Corps when that was not settled and we had to create our own manual that was a counterpart to the law because basically the law said that wetlands are those areas that are inundated or saturated sufficient to support and that under normal circumstances do support a prevalence of plant life typically adapted to saturated soil conditions. We had to take that, that one paragraph from the law and create a, a manual that looked at almost 3,000 plants and giving them a wetland indicator status, looking at wetland soils, determining you know, which soils you know, support hydrophytes or wetland plants and which do not, you know, indicators of wetland hydrology. You can look at a wetland today, it doesn't look like a wetland, but uh, depending on you know, how long the growing season the window is, it can be a wetland because it's wet enough and those areas are regulated and um, we discourage the unnecessary destruction of wetlands. Um, it, you know, but the average person doesn't understand this. They don't understand the science. They don't understand why wetlands are so important. Uh, it's almost in a, in a cosmic way you have to explain that the wetlands on this piece of property can affect water quality downstream can affect the Chesapeake Bay, can affect fish. You know, there's there's a connection between the headwaters and the wetlands and, you know, our living resource that we all depend on out here, fish. Could you point to um, a wetlands area connected to the Rappahannock that um, looks different now than when you were in college? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say so. It's because here we have pockets of wet areas this time of year. The growing season has started. And those wetland areas are vernal, okay? Like you have vernal plants. They're only there in the spring. There's pockets of water that are very, very important for amphibians. If the amphibians don't have that yearly cycle to lay eggs, they die. But those areas are wetland. By the time June rolls around, they're dry as a bone. But are they any less important? Uh, as another wetland that's wet all year long. Uh, they're 
they have different values, but they're extremely important. And uh, we need to be able to identify them before we can uh, protect them. And that takes people who have the training and understanding of plants, animals, soils, hydrology, that can make that call and define that as wetland. Uh, and that's a good part of what I did as a consultant is delineate the wetlands. You know, and then the, the landowner, developer, builder would take that wetland study to the state and federal regulatory agency and say, do I get a permit to destroy this? And sometimes they get a permit for small impacts, sometimes there's no permits needed, sometimes they say stay completely out of the wetland. Uh, but that takes um, judgment and it takes a weighing of factors and it takes the understanding of wetlands ecology and how important that wetland is. You know, uh, wetlands are connected by streams usually in this region and if you change the natural drainage of the landscape that affects another part of the landscape downstream. Uh, but a landowner on his parcel doesn't always see that so you need people not only to explain the regulations but to explain why these areas are so important and can you have your project you know, farther up in the watershed. And most people in this country, in this state, understand that and, and, and agree. Uh, there's still a few few instances where people don't understand it. Your land is your land to do with what you want. But you do have a right to get a permit or to apply for a permit. And that's what I spent a good part of my career doing is meeting with landowners and talking them out of destroying the wetland and explaining their options. And, um, for unavoidable impacts, they get their permit, they have to mitigate, make wetlands or buy mitigation credit from a wetland bank. But a trend I've seen through my career is that um, our society is becoming more aware of the importance of our water resources and the, the tolerance level of impacting the wetlands getting less and less. We don't like to see wetlands destroyed. Um, and it's very, very expensive to mitigate wetlands now which is a disincentive to want to destroy the, the wetland. So um, by the time I ended my career, um, I felt like I had created, in this area, the roots of understanding through the media, through speaking engagements, uh, through the Friends of Rappahannock, that wetlands are extremely important, and that if you have plans to, to modify them or change them in any way, contact your local official and have that discussion. One of my next questions was going to be about um, working with uh, Growling and Robertson. Mm -hmm. Remembering correctly from yesterday, from speaking with you yesterday, mm -hmm. that was your first job out of college? No, my first job out of college was actually working in a biohazard laboratory. Um, I had to wear a bunny suit and I had to um, grow cultures of HIV in these large tanks uh, to create tests that could test positive or negative for HIV infection. Uh, it's called viral production, which was probably about the most unhappy two years of my life, working in isolation and working with biohazard materials all the time. Um, but it was a professional job, you know, and I, I worked in my field of biology at the scale of the, the micro, the micro, the, the very, very small. Uh, my, my minor was in chemistry, but when I when I found that I could be a wetland consultant, I was closer to working with plants in the outdoors and working on the macro scale, the large scale, was really where I was the most happy. And I found that was where I needed to be. So the second job with Rowling and Robertson. Yeah. Um, could you tell me about one of the most important wetland projects that um, you helped work on and it might have been a success story, or it sounds like some wetland projects also probably involved some destruction of a project that was really important during your time there. Well, again, uh, during that phase of my life, uh, mostly what I did was go out on tracts of land and spend several days and sometimes several weeks uh, flagging or delineating the wetlands and creating a wetlands delineation report, applying the, the, the known manual methodology and the science uh, to, to doing that, but very often the wetland delineation report would then be handed to the uh, proponent of a project and I wouldn't necessarily get involved with the permitting of that project, but there were a few and one of them was called Jennings Pond 
um, in Spotsylvania County, somebody wanted to build a championship ski pond, and it took it took uh, going through the permit process to get a permit to impact uh, uh, several hundred linear feet of a stream and some wetlands. At that time, back in the 80s, it was very easy to get permits from the state government and the federal government to impact wetlands. You essentially got a uh, a, a permit that was written on the spot, torn off, given to you, and what you had was a carbon copy. There were no, there was no uh, computers, there was no word processing, no internet. Internet didn't come in vogue to the early 90s. So uh, I can remember, I can remember uh, getting the core rep out and uh, reviewing a project and saying, look, they're going to impact wetlands here. We're going to make three acres over here. Fine, fill out the form. Here it is. Times have drastically changed. It's it's not that way anymore. Um, in fact, ponds of that scale, or lakes, are rarely built. Rarely built because of the need for permitting, and the permit process itself is so hard to go through to impact something of that scale. Uh, I can remember working on large tracts of land in uh, Tidewater, Virginia, that essentially every square foot of a piece of property was wetland and giving that to a proponent. What do you do now? You know, everything there you build on is going to be wet. Um, at some point I decided rather than just do a report and turn it over, maybe I should be the regulator. You know, I should be the guy working with the public on those projects. And that's why I went from being a consultant to actually working in the public sector because I saw the need to um, explain to people, um, you know, how important these areas are and if we can find another viable alternative, let's work on that. You know, and that, that's part of what the permit process was about, is looking for alternatives that were available and practicable. And I had great success doing that with the core. Uh, but, uh, but the consulting world was cutting your teeth. It was kind of getting the, getting the knowledge and the background, the science there. But the regulatory world, you know, you have to, you have to work with people, you have to use multidisciplinary tools to affect change. Uh, forming a team, getting getting experts together and look at a project and and you know kind of uh, weigh all the ups and downs. Um, finding the, the, the middle ground, if you will. Um, I worked with silver companies here in Fredericksburg on Celebrate Virginia, north and south. What came out of that uh, co collaboration with the agencies was low impact development for this region. We helped take a, a concept from Largo, Maryland, John Tippett and I, one of the early directors here, and look at a way of preserving streams, yet getting your stormwater management by not damming up streams, but by getting infiltration, using the natural features of the landscape, using trees, using um, bioengineered swales to hold water, uh, uh, looking at the flow paths of water through a development site where you you keep the natural features, you keep the permeable soils, um, you um, shrink your, your envelope of your development but not really give up developable space because these stormwater ponds just chew up the landscape and if you can treat that same volume of stormwater you know, in the upland using you know, uh, depositional areas and uh, bio filters and, and rain gardens, you, know, you, you have achieved uh, the net goal of no net loss of the environment, uh, the aquatic environment. Uh, you know, there's still going to be some development, but you, but you um, look at the footprint of the, of the development, and you find ways of um, softening that that impact on the environment. And um, low impact development allowed a way of starting with stormwater, and kind of engineering in reverse from, you know, from the beginning. You know, and, and then looking at how you can uh, meet your, your project goal in the watershed, getting that same amount of water into the ground the way it should to feed those streams below so you don't change the hydrograph of those streams and how they flow. What were some of the most important things you learned as a consultant that you began to use um, when you switched careers into the Army Corps of Engineers? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that Learning to listen, um, trying to keep on the learning curve, um, understanding that 
there's, there's going to be complexity and controversy when you work with people and large projects. Um, learning to get the opinions of others and look at environmental documents through the lens of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, um, you know, are there alternatives to destroying the environment? How do you develop alternatives? Do you accept what's on paper? Do you accept the blueprints? This is what they want to do. You know, that is a virtuality. That blueprint can change. And the proponent of that blueprint, the developer, can get their way, but if they can have um, the proper uh, environmental documentation to see what the pitfalls are, they can avoid those pitfalls and have a viable project. Basically, finding out that there's a lot more going on in the realm of development than just a planning department and the approval of a plan. There's th three levels of government, local, state, and federal. There's local wetlands boards, there's the Department of Environmental Quality, there's the Virginia Marine Resources Commission, there's the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, there's Fish and Wildlife Service, there's EPA. I can, I can go on naming agency after agency after agency. Most of them are advisory, not regulatory, okay? But those agencies can give you scientific data that help you make an informed decision. Knowing that biology isn't the end all of knowing, the study of living things um, implies that you you know everything, but there's chemistry, there's there's the physical properties, there's geology. I mean, there's so much that goes into looking at the environment, and there's so many different people that have um, expertise in looking at the environment, learning how to consult with the different agencies and interest groups and interested parts of the public that have a say. When you began at the court, what were some of the agencies that you felt like, I don't know if allies is the right word, but shared a sense of commitment to mm -hmm. what sounds like was a moment of transition to mm -hmm. the court, much more focused on environmental preservation. What were some of the other agencies that you felt like that shared um, in that mission? I felt that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had a stock in protecting the environment and explaining why, you know, why are rare species so important? You know, um, uh, the game department is their corollary at the state level. You know, you don't know what's out there. Uh, these agencies keep information, they keep a database on the environment. Uh, so they're, they're committed because they know. And if you know, if you have knowledge of something, um, you, you want to be able to share it but um, if the public isn't asking for it, they're not going to see it. So with my agency, I could ask and I could receive information that helped me uh, make an informed decision. The EPA seemed a little more remote, although on bigger projects, uh, EPA would come down and, um, and be a voice for the environment and ask questions. Uh, my corollary at the state level the Department of Environmental Quality, they're regulatory. They have their wetlands protection permit program. But in the beginning, they didn't have that. They had uh, what's known as Section 401 water quality certification, where they would certify our permit actions, but they didn't give much input. It's a changed world now. Uh, the people of the state have almost an equal role at the federal government in a very, very similar program looking at wetlands and permitting and preservation. Was there a big project you worked on in this region before you began working on the um, Emory Dam Room? Well, there's, there, there were many before and there were many since. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that made my work extremely interesting, dealing not just with wetlands and streams and rivers and harbors and so forth, but um, historic properties. Um, because I worked for a federal agency, there's something called Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, which meant that federal agencies have to look at their, their permitting or look at how their review affects historic properties. 
And I began to find out early in my career that we are right here in the cradle of, of vast historic properties. We've got the greatest density of, of archaeological sites, architectural sites, historic districts, and anywhere in the entire country. There's probably three states that would argue they're the most historic with known resources. They'd be Florida, Massachusetts, Virginia. But Virginia was the gateway in many ways to civilization in, in North America. We're not counting the French, we're not counting the St. Lawrence River and how the French came into this country. We're, we're, but we're talking about the Mid-Atlantic and uh, Virginia played a huge role in, in uh, uh, making us who we are. So I learned through my work that um, Virginia is one of the most historic states and in all Virginia this region has tremendous resources. So I'd be looking at an application for development to impact wetlands, but in fact we consult with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. We find there's a Civil War battlefield here, there's a Native American site here, okay, there's an architectural site over here. All of these are either listed or eligible for listing on the National Register. That makes your work really complicated um, because now you have to consult with many, many more interest groups and people. And what you seek is the ability to mitigate the effects of permitting on historic resources. And that really is difficult because when you, like for instance, if you destroy a wetland, you can rebuild a wetland, okay, in theory, okay, but when you impact a historic property, it's gone forever. It's obliterated. You know, you have written record, but you don't have a full record. And so we worked very hard to protect archaeological sites. Uh, I worked with the Civil War Preservation Trust. I worked with the Association for Preservation of Civil War Sites. Um, I have many, many success stories where landowners put aside chunks of land, you know, five acres here, ten acres here. Uh, silver companies proper 300 acres on the other side of the river. Uh, just towards the end of my career, another project down on Route 3, the Benz property, they're putting aside uh, almost 300 acres along Route 3. You have to work with the National Park Service, you have to work with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. You have to listen to these agencies. And uh, many of these projects are very controversial because you don't want to issue a permit that would impact a Civil War site where men fought and died. The Park Service has told me over and over again the most blood-soaked ground in all of America is right here, right here. I mean, even on this property along Route 3, there's men who, who fought and died. Um, hallowed ground. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, there, there's so many instances where, um, you know, you can look on the, on the landscape and what you see is a farm, but if you're somebody who comes where their ancestors died and they look out there, they can, that, that field up here, the May 1st Battle of 1863, the opening Chancellorsville, you can, you can get a sense, it conveys a sense of what happened there in the battle, and these areas need to be preserved. Um, I've been to India four times. I have a daughter-in-law from India. India is chock full of history. It's a living museum. Thank you, disagreed with me. And, uh, but here in America, you know, we're a relatively young country. We need to covet our history. We need to protect our history. If, if we destroy our history, uh, we don't know who we are. What are we, you know? And so um, it's very important, very important here to respect history. Uh, next month, I'm being honored with an award from the Civil War Preservation Trust for my work in this area, which they say is combined almost a thousand acres of protection of, of mostly Civil War sites. It all adds up, these little, you know, one acre, two acre, three acre, five acre, ten acre, you know, postage stamp areas along development, preserved in, the, in, in, in strategic areas, uh, helps maintain our sense of history. Part of that story is also that uh, you're coming up against developers and development. You do. You, you, you do. And um, uh, I uh, uh, and I feel ill-prepared sometimes to um, deal with the ire of the landowners who don't understand 
uh, initially. Um, you have to develop uh, people skills. Okay, you have to be able to um, take criticism, you know, and not lose your temper. If you work, if you're a public servant, you 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 basically uh, you know have to get cussed at, shouted at, and accused and threatened. I've been pulled into court. You know, I've been cussed at. I've been uh, virtually threatened with my life, uh, but I've blown it all off as you know just part of the job and. It's something that I need to do to keep focused. And if I stay focused on the environment and not on the individuals who are upset, we'll get through this somehow because even the landowners who get upset, they come around one day and they thank you. And in many instances, I've had, had uh, horribly uh, ghoulish developers initially who uh, used foul language to me in my face come back and say, thank you, Hal. Thank you. You helped me realize how important this is and that I could still do my project. I'm not bankrupt like I accused you of making me and my family. But look what I have achieved, you know. And I'm going to build a granite monument right over there and show the world that I love this place. And that, see, and and, and, and that's the fulfillment of, of your work. And that's when you can say that, God darn it, you know, if I, if 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 I just let off that control stick for a minute, this place is going to go down because I've about had enough of it, you know. But all of us, you know, work in the professional field, you know, and deal with projects that affect people's lives are going to come up against that. But you learn uh, people skills, awesome people skills. You know, so just keep working with them, listen to them, and, and trying to find a way uh, to get through it. Uh, and, and you do. And you do. And, and every one of them, in every instance, has found a successful resolution. And, and many of them, an apology letter and a Christmas card from those forces out there that, are, that didn't understand the process at first, but we got through it. Is there a case from early in your career that you learned a lot from uh, in terms of perhaps not issuing a permit or that you ended up, you know, either, well, that just became influential in, in dealing with the process? Well, um, one thing I learned is that some days you're not going to succeed you know, at getting your way because you're not in control. You work for a federal agency and there's certain things that your management has asked you to do. And uh, sometimes your management will tell you, issue the permit, okay. But I had the uh, good fortune of coming back the next day and looking at it afresh and feeling that let's look at this from another angle. You know, maybe we can find a, a better way to do this. and. Um, there's been probably less than a handful of projects in my career that I could say that didn't have a happy outcome. Uh, where management, you know, who I worked for, told me to issue the permit. But in not one instance did I find it to be unethical. It was just that the permit process with Corps of Engineers is not absolutely perfect. It's not the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, but it's a program that sought a middle ground. And uh, this this concept of unavoidable impacts, I'm, in most cases, I'm going to find a way for a landowner to avoid impacting the wetland. We will find another alternative to, to this. This is, you know, not acceptable. But you can't. What I learned is you just don't tell them no. There's a way to say no. There's a way to say no. You know that the public respects. And amazingly, what most of the public wants. Is not just a yes or no, but they just want an answer. They want an answer, you know, and they don't want to beat around the bush. So you know, so you find a way to give them strong indications of how the the, the permit processing would go and what we're going to get at the end. And you know, you, you know, if you work with me, I'll work with you. And ninety nine point nine percent of the public uh, had that attitude. You know, let's work together, do the site visit, let's see your paperwork. You know, here's what you're going to need. You're going to need this, 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 and this. If you can get this, 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 and this, then we can make a better informed decision about your project. And so that that's a lot of what I did. But there's that. There's always going to be those instances where, uh, man, you you walk into a bus saw, you know, and this this is ugly, you know. Before you, you know it, uh, you know, your two state senators and your congressman and the Pentagon have found out that you're a no good SOP. You know, from some landowner that didn't like a permit decision, but 
when you look closer at it and the details of it, it bears out that we did what we were tasked to do, issue or deny a permit. What year did you join the Army Corps of Engineers? Uh, 1991. When you began working there in 1991, was there already discussion uh, going on about the Ember Dam removal? Not to my knowledge. Um, what I remember is in the summer of 1993, John Tippett, the former director, had an idea and it might have been through the game department that there could be a way of working on a project to remove Embry Dam. And we went off to Richmond to talk to the game department. Um, Senator Ed Houck put $20,000 in the budget to remove the Embry Dam, which was laughable, you know, because I think that would buy a stick of dynamite. Uh, so, so it began with, with a state effort, well, local effort, state effort, and it percolated up to a federal effort. And that happened in the mid-90s when Senator John Warner got involved. In fact, uh, there was a meeting at Brompton House, uh, the University of Mary Washington, with um, the city council members and mayor and game department officials and Corps of Engineers. I was asked to attend, and Senator John Warner was there for the commencement. This was the May of 95, 96. And, uh, a discussion was made, you know, do we want the federal government to come in and remove this dam? And my role was to explain that you could get a permit to remove the Embry Dam, but you'd have to do an environmental impact statement. Something of that size is going to take environmental study. You just can't go out there with a chest full of dynamite and blow it down. You know, there's going to have to be some thought. Uh, Senator Warner made the point that if you go alone, or if you work with the Corps, you're going to be up to your bootstraps with environmental regulation. You might as well let the Corps do this. And that kind of got things going at that point. Uh, I don't think the city wanted it to be a federalized effort, but it cost $8 million to remove the Embry Dam, which included the dredging, the studies, everything. And it got done. Uh, and it's a good thing, but it's not there anymore. The living resource, the fish that come up river, 700 miles more of streams and spawning areas, stripers, yellow perch, uh, smallmouth, largemouth bass, American shad. The game department, they get empirical data. You know what's coming up the river now. You know there's a world that only anglers know <laughs> that exists now in the upper reaches of the Rappahannock and all of its tributaries because of the breach of the Ember Dam, removal of the Ember Dam. Very important. Was that the major impetus or framing of why uh, removing it would be a good project? Would be restoring the river, increasing flow, increasing wildlife, or were there other parts of why the project might be beneficial? Well, it was initially um, finding the right congressional authorization that would allow the Corps to remove the dam. And amazingly, it came in under authorization that wasn't a dam removal authorization. It was an environmental restoration authorization. The Corps wanted to do stream restoration all up and down the watershed, which would have been infeasible because it's most of the degraded streams are on private property. It could be an exercise that would take decades to identify all the sites. What eventually played out, Senator John Warner had to put a line item okay, in the budget it was specifically to remove the Embry Dam and the Corps of Engineers to do that. Uh, at that time, um, our agency uh, had the tools to do this, but all the other funding that went with environmental restoration wouldn't happen because it would just take forever to identify all the sites and work on private property. So that was seen as an impediment to the project at hand that the public in this region wanted was the removal of the dam. What were some of the reasons you were hearing, you know, at that point as a community member and as someone not necessarily in your, in your 
job mm -hmm. in core, but just someone involved and observing. What were some of the main reasons the community wanted the dam removed? Well, locally here, um, there were instances of kids falling off the, the dam and hurting themselves, and a young fellow named Justin Cook drowned. My friend Jerry Benhays found his body when the police were doing their search. Um, the city was scared to death the dam was going to fail. The city had their water supply here, okay? And they were afraid because it was uh, downstream of I-95. The city of Fredericksburg wanted to abandon their intake at the Embry Dam. We helped them with that to form a regional water supply where the Spotsylvania County, the city of Fredericksburg could combine you know, their water treatment plant five miles upstream which then obviated the need for having an old concrete structure that was 100 years old out there. Remove it. It was falling apart. It was crumbling. It was seen as a nuisance. It, it, it was a historic property. A lot of people in the region, you know, wanted us to tread very lightly because you destroy a, anything that's over 100 years old in this region, there's going to be people that fight you. They don't want it. But when the Embry Dam was breached in February 2004, it seemed that everybody in this region came out for it, and it was one of the first times I've ever seen a project of that magnitude have the entire community behind it. There was nobody saying, let's not remove the dam. It was everybody on board. But we had to study its history. You know, we had to preserve parts of the dam on each side. That created some controversy on the Stafford side. Um, the landowner didn't want to see the abutments down below. Uh, it, you know, it created a nuisance to see anything remaining of the dam. But, but those are small complaints, you know, compared to removing a dam. It was a big project. It was, it was uh, one of the biggest things that, that happened in this region since the Civil War, in my opinion, or the building of I-95 or the Route 1 that went through the city of Fredericksburg, you know. Uh, but everybody got behind it, and it got done. If you don't have the public behind you on a project, you won't ever see it come to completion, which applies for any large project that comes to an area. If you don't have public support, you know, it's just not going to happen. But the public got behind the removal of the Embry Dam when it happened. Do you remember instances where you were providing your expertise, uh, not necessarily in your official job mm -hmm. duties with the Army Corps of Engineers, but with the expertise about to help public understand why this was beneficial to help build public support? Well, there were speaking engagements, but um, I can remember um, State Senator Ed Houck talking with me several times. What are we going to do, How? You know, what are we going to do? Well, we, we draft a letter, you know, to the court. I helped him with that. Uh, I have to give a lot of credit to Senator Howe for pushing, for pushing, pushing, getting, getting us at the table. You know, we just didn't volunteer a project. We had to be asked to come. We did a recon survey. We, we did a feasibility study. Say, yes, this appears to be in the national interest to remove this dam because it supports national issues. Environmental restoration, fisheries, you know, um, anadromous fish that go up all rivers in the eastern seaboard. You know, this is important to do. Uh, but as a citizen, um, there wasn't much. Just being an observer and being able to talk to people and get them together to meet. There were people, I remember uh, Marsha Keener, who was um, with uh, Friends of the ri of, of Rivers, Friends of Virginia's Rivers, came to me, how, how do we do this? How do we get a, a, an initiative to remove every dam? You know, who do we talk to? You know, basically facilitating. But uh, most importantly, when the Corps got on board, I was asked to help professionally, and I was chosen to be on the project delivery team to deliver a, a product, the removal of the dam, the restoration of a mile of the river upstream. Um, and that was done. And so I uh, had saw a project that began, you know, people talking, and then uh, the, the media getting involved, and then, you know, the state senators, and then finally the federal government. So it took a process of everybody working to, to communicate and find a way to make this happen. In the, it sounds like years preceding 
the actual earmark and the funding yes. from that Warner helped yes. Senator Warner helped lead. And it also sounds like you were doing some reconnaissance. You said some yeah. claiming. Could you tell me about the process of uh, your professional work on that and management uh, supporting that in the sense that I'm sure like every government agency you're probably underfunded, time is hard to come by, and you weren't necessarily sure how far this project was going to go. Was it hard right. for your agency and, and managers in your region to say, yes, go spend time doing this feasibility study, go do this reconnaissance? Um, how did that process work? Well, I think the best way to describe how it worked was, um, is there a local interest? The, the media, it seemed like every every summer you had like the the slowest summer in the history of the Freelance Star. They do a story about the Embry Dam being removed. And, it, and to the locals it seemed like a big joke, you know, because it's never going to happen. The removal of Embry Dam is just like one of those dreams you have out there. It's, I want it so bad, but it's so far behind the clouds, you know, we'll just keep talking about it, keep reaching for it, but we really don't know how to get it. It's out of sight, you just can't ever acquire it. But um, uh, but there was a way of, of getting, you know, the, the public officials into the same room to talk about it and talk about the needed letters of support. And I helped with that. Uh, I talked to John Warner, uh, I spoke in front of John Warner. Uh, I got the city of Fredericksburg um, interested in, in getting this done, but how are we going to do it when our water intake is there? You know, They want to do it, but they don't want to do it. But it seemed like the first piece of the puzzle is getting that intake moved up river. And I took, I mean, when I say I, um, I didn't do it uh, personally, but it seemed that what was happening, my agency, was taking the city of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania County, and banging heads together and saying, you know, you guys can't increase your water supply for the region in two different places. You need to combine together one straw on the river and cut that water consumption in half and put limits on what you take out of the Rappahannock River and put your intake five miles up river and look into the feasibility of combining your water supply and how much it would save this region. You know, in costs, in water consumption, and that would obviate the need for the Embry Dam sitting out here too. You get a bonus, and I saw that process gradually, gradually, gradually happen. So really, um, when I when I look back over the things I'm most proud of with that specific project with the Embry Dam removal, I think about the years it took with Spotsylvania County and the city of Fredericksburg getting them in the same room to talk because the first instance when that happened, when I got them in the room to talk, um, Kim Payne, the Spotsylvania County um, administrator, looked at me and said, I must not be from Virginia. We don't have regional cooperation in Virginia. But he, he bit his words, you know, because at the end, 10 years later, they are opening a new plant. You know, they're not taking water from the Embry Dam. Their intake has been abandoned there. Um, so that getting that done, setting the groundwork, was really important. But, uh, but it took a big leap of faith because um, the city of Fredericksburg, with their intake at Embry Dam, they wanted to double their intake, double their, their volume, double, du you know, bit, size it bigger. And Spotsylvania County, they wanted to, to take more water, you know, double their, their, their amount. Um, we look at the river holistically. It's one river, you know, and you just can't keep cutting pieces of the puzzle out of the pie and saying, you know, that you have anything left. We're going to look at, you know, one environmental report for how much water is coming out of the river. This is the limit for how much you can take, how much water has to stay in the river at all times, different times of the year. You can't take any more. And the only way to, to orchestrate this, and then Stafford coming in for a water supply, is, is to have one report that addresses one straw in the river. You know, where they know when it's time to turn off their pumps and allow a flow by, which protects fish and protects recreation and water quality. So there's a lot of stuff that I got to do in my work, I was lucky to do, that I 
feel that I was directly on the hot seat responsible for that um, ultimately led to a project like the Every Dam Removal Project because you, you had to you had to address that intake at, at Every Dam. And if you remove it, then the project could conceivably go forward with federal funding to make it happen. I feel that you know, 50 years from now, people will look back and they'll go, God, they removed that dam for $8 million? That's nothing. $8 million, you know? Uh, but of course, you know, $8 million will seem like a lot less 50 years from now, but, but not really. When you look at how important our environment is and what has to happen to protect the environment, uh, an example would be Flint, Michigan. You know, oh, it's gonna cost more money to, you know, treat uh, water coming out of the Flint River uh, for for its high acidity that affects lead affects people's lives and all like that. But it but you have to you have to you know look at our water resources through the lens of 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 our lives. You know and and uh, what uh, we are water. You know we are mostly water. We live on a watery planet. We have to really think hard about preserving our water resources. And through my work. With the core that got hammered in me time and time again, and the most important thing out there that we need to protect, you know, our air, our land, our water, you know, and uh, the city of Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania County, Stafford, they have water for their citizens. The Rappahannock has plenty of water. The flow bys are set very high. We determine what those levels were in the river that have to be there at all times. The river can never be low. When they take water, they have to store water in skimmer reservoirs during the high flows in the winter. Was the permitting process for the new intake and the water, um, the water system for Spotsylvania and Frederick, did that also fall under the Army? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. um, under Rivers and Harbors Act, um, any structure that's put into a navigable waterway requires a permit. For instance, if you take a, a pier or a dock, a jetty, you know, some structure, you have a channel word out in the water, that's going to need a core permit. It also applies to a water intake that would go into a waterway. So we look at the footprint of that intake in the waterway and the water that's being taken from the waterway. Uh, so we have to, had to pay attention to, you know, flows in the river, we had to define, you know, what flows are the absolute optimum for fish, for people, for water quality. And, you know, anything above that, you could skim for a reservoir and not affect, in a, I mean, in a very negligible sense, the flows in the river. An example would be where the Rappahannock River is, is flowing right now, uh, you could have a uh, 1,000 665 cubic feet per second going by. Uh, if you're only taking, you know, six million gallons a day, it's a very, very, very negligible amount of water. It's hard to measure, really, when you think about it. But if the river's down to, you know, 300 cubic feet per second, and you're taking, you know, six million gallons a day, which which equates to about, you know, three CFS, you know that. You start to see some effect. So it's it's a tricky science, but it's a lot easier to to regulate and orchestrate, you know, flow by conditions when you have one straw in the river, one intake, one rule that the locality has to follow, and not contravene those flows or take more than they're allowed to. Because uh, amazingly, you know, my agency was a task to say this amount of water in the river must stay at all times to protect the aquatic environment. And, uh, but we didn't know what that level was. We spent a year canoeing, talking to fishermen, measuring, to come up with what were you know, the optimal flow buys for the river to protect its, its qualities. Talking about minimum in-stream flow, talking about the mean annual flow, cubic feet per second, million gallons a day. These are concepts that most people struggle with. I didn't know anything about hydrology when I started the core, but, but I got on board quick because you're looking at graphs, you're looking at flow by curves, you're looking at 
you know, worst case scenario during a drought, what happens if, if a locality needs to pull 20 million gallons a day out of a river that only has 3 million gallons a day going by? You know, how do you deal with these inevitabilities? You plan for the worst. You plan for the optimum, you know. And um, you look at a locality's uh, deficit here, they're running out of water. Spotsylvania County said they would run out of water in 1997. They wanted to build a reservoir on the Po River. It would have impacted 660 acres of wetlands. It's hard to conceive what that's like, but the Po River Valley that they were going to flood was huge. When I got into the Corps, that would have required an environmental impact statement. Uh, Spotsylvania County decided to look at alternatives. We looked at 16 alternatives. The least environmentally damaging practical alternative was hunting run, a small stream adjacent to the Rapidan, for them to build their reservoir on. But they would have to pull water out of the Rappahannock. So they had their application in. City of Fredericksburg wanted to expand their water supply. We got the two localities in the same room to create one environmental assessment, one environmental document to look at, which, which made it a lot easier to regulate them and a lot easier for the localities to understand what was their limit. It's like delineating a wetland. You know, here's a line in the sand. That's wetland. That's upland. You can develop the upland. You know, with the Rappahannock River. Here's the Rappahannock River. You know, everyone who uses it has a right up to a point where you regulate it, and the Corps had the right to regulate that water that's in the river, which was a whole new twist to regulating wetlands dealing with water because water, the, the river you touch now isn't the same river it was five minutes ago. Flows in rivers change constantly. You know, the Rappahannock's a very flashy river up and down. Its, hyd it's hydrograph, you know, can change on a dime. You know, it can be out of banks one day, the next day it's dry as a bone. It, you know, how do you, how do you plan a water supply from a river like that? That would be the challenge. One of the other things that's happening at this time period mm -hmm. is regional growth. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't want to say quite an exponential growth, but, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that don't always mix well is regional growth and environmental protection. Um, what were some of the conversations about the region growing and how you would both protect the river, um, increase water supply, or make it a steady or planable or effective water supply uh, if it wasn't necessarily an expansion in right. terms of you know, cubic feet. Right. Um, what were those conversations like? Well, the conversations would be like this. Um, a locality um, would um, hire a consultant to look at their, their water use, would look at uh, what's known as a planning period where they say that you know, X amount of people are coming into this region, okay, and X amount of people are going into the high growth region where we need to provide water. And at the rate of water consumption, you, know, you develop um, what's known as a curve that, that predicts their water deficit year, okay. Their water deficit year could be five years out, it could be 50 years out. Uh, Spotsylvania County and the city of Fredericksburg found that their water deficit year was growing upon them. And, um, and, you know, to give some um, credit to Spotsylvania County, they developed a, a program to conserve water, to maybe push, push that deficit year out farther because they, they knew it was going to be an uphill battle getting their own water supply. Uh, they wanted to dam water, you know, in Spotsylvania County, the Po River. And uh, everything seemed to be on board, you know, until um, it, it hit our, our desk. And, and when I came in in 91, it was at that point where our colonel in Norfolk wrote the county a letter saying, you know, you got to look at alternatives. It would be an uphill battle to get your water supply here. So what does a locality do? Do they stop growth? You know, how do you, how do you do it? You know, so those, all those questions are being asked. And, and so you have a region, you know, this was the fastest growing region in the state for, for many, many years. And localities trying to, to get a handle on that, you know, like what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to how are we going to create you know the primary settlement zones where you have you know more dense development 
and have you know public water supply when our water supply is is dwindling you know they had the Nye River Reservoir here in Spotsylvania County and, and, it, and it was a small reservoir compared to what the needs were you know so um, I, I came in at a time when all that was was, was going on and the uh, consultants reports were forecasting gloom and doom you know in the late 90s um, one thing about that is always it seems the localities they forecast worst case scenario you know so their deficit year would be 1997 but you can always do something you know to forestall running out of water in 1997 you know and that's what the county had to do because they didn't get their their permit for hunting run reservoir until you know later until gosh you know um, 2004 I mean, it was like out there in the future um, so an example would be um, Newport News water supply wanted to dam make this huge huge King William reservoir you know uh, we're running out of water you know um, all these localities together depend on this we're running out of water but they find that when you scrutinize the data and water consumption and you know gallons per person per day used and fixtures and, and leakage and you know there are all kinds of you know technologies that come in to conserve water it your your need isn't really that dire you know but when you look at it from their perspective the the, the public works directors are always going to forecast gloom and doom because they know that there's going to be some study there's going to be some regulatory um, reports and review and assessment and questions and you know that process can go on for decades so it sounds like the two biggest hurdles to removing the Embry Dam first uh, building a new water supply mm -hmm. upriver and then the funding the funding uh, there are other issues the real estate issues property owners issues there was the, the canal behind us here the canal would would dry up you know um, the canal would would be a dead zone you know the, what would happen to the to the water what would happen to the fish um, last week I walked along this canal I counted 77 uh, eastern painted turtles these large turtles I mean, this thing is chock full of life out here but essentially the canal it functions as a stormwater management pond. You know, it's, it's 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 not a natural wetland. But the city didn't want to see their their canal gone. They didn't want to see the water dry up. So, you know, you dam up one end of it. You know, uh, it it never had free flowing water going through it. Uh, well, uh, back in the 1850s, you had the crib dam. You had bateau. You know, she, well, boats can be through. But, uh, but when the city says, you know, we want to see our canal unchanged we listened to them you know so we found a way to to do that um, initially there was an aeration system put through the canal you know so more oxygen in the water column for fish uh, that was found not to be necessary uh, there were people afraid that if you make the water too clean it's going to be like an aquarium we don't want to look down and see absolutely clean water like a swimming pool you know there's always going to be People complain, always going to be issues, but you deal with them one by one by one, you know. And uh, so, but when you deal with the public, you know, you have to listen, and you have to try to understand their perspective and explain, and you know, and uh, uh, so it's it's a process of working with people. It goes back to that, making yourself available, listening. What were some of the challenging? issues related to real estate well um, for instance at the water's edge okay with Embry Dam you have a water line okay but when you breach the dam and you remove the dam property extends out farther you know so whose property is that now you have to deal with that because uh, people believe that that property belongs to them it's been in their family's deed of record for a century or more. Um, if you um, allow them to have more land along the river, are they going to be allowed to develop that land? Uh, you know, if, there's questions about.
property. A, a landowner on top was afraid that if the dam was blown, it would shake the foundations of his house. So we had to study that. You know, there, you know, you have to, you have to keep listening. You have to keep addressing the issues one by one, and hopefully, you get them all. Uh, one of the unforeseen issues with the removal of the dam has been the silt that comes down the river, and uh, that has been a problem addressing because. You know, one thing a lot of people don't understand is that most of the silt that was behind the dam was dredged and put in upland containment. Uh, and also, when you get big storms coming down the river, a lot of bed loads moved. And it's moved not just from where the dam was, but from way upriver. But, you know, and uh, some of the data I've seen from USGS show the um, amount of silt in the water column from these big floods exceeds what was ever behind the Embry Dam before it was breached. And it ends up down here. I have articles from Freelance Star that go back before the Embry Dam was breached talking about the silt that comes down the river. Since I've lived in Fredericksburg, there's always been issues with silt. You know, the visual, you know, knowledge that there's silt in the river down here. Uh, why is that? Well, one thing, you know, the Rappahannock River is a fast-moving River, it's Lodic, meaning fast moving water, hitting the fall line of the Rappahannock, which is estuarine, tidal, where the two hit, the silt falls out. Okay? Um, there's a misconception that the, the floods, or what they call freshets, wash the silt away. But in my understanding of river geomorphology, it's the big events that drop the silt, and it's the small uh, stormwater events that gradually carry the silt away. If this didn't happen, there'd be no river because more silt would come, more silt would come, it would just build up, there'd be no river. There's people who believe that one day the Rappahannock River is going to disappear. They really believe this because of all the silt coming down. But it's a process of bed load movement. And in my opinion, a lot of the bed load in the upper reaches of the Rapidan River uh, come from disturbed stream banks. And uh, that needs to be addressed. Landowners need to be made aware of the amount of sediment that comes off those farms and off those stream banks that are not protected with forest buffers. Friends of Rappahannock has a goal to do that and has been having success meeting that goal. I had some success with the Corps of Engineers working with landowners to restore stream banks back in the 90s. Uh, but they're there. You know, um, The Rappahannock River, especially its tributary, the Rapidan, has been uh, tinkered with and, and, and farmed and uh, changed. You know, and farming by its very nature is land disturbing. A lot of that silt comes off those farms. If you don't have the, the, the buffers there, it's going to come off the stream banks as well. So uh, getting an understanding of the entire system takes a real stretch of the imagination. But what we see locally, we see the silt here, we don't like it. Uh, it's easy to blame, you know, the core. It's easy to blame the landowners up, up river, but uh, but it's a fact that the city of Fredericksburg is here because ships could come up, and this was the head of navigation back in the early uh, 1700s, 1746. Uh, ships don't come up anymore <laughs> because there's been a change. Another thing, you know, the Embry Dam was 22 feet high. And it was a lake, but when it comes down, you know, there's going to be something below it going up a little bit. There has to be some adjustment. It happens naturally. Uh, when the Embry Dam was breached, there was bathymetric surveys done after the breach, before the breach, to show that some areas are shallower, some areas are deeper, but on balance, you know, it's still the Rappahannock River, um, and it's still got its its dynamism to create shallow areas and deep areas. and uh, But there's still the need to address the source of the silt. Were there people upstream who were interested that had water rights in terms that were part of the consideration? Yes, there were. And that discussion had to happen with our agency, with our legal counsel. Uh, but uh, the real estate issues were minor issues compared to the fact that you're removing a, a concrete structure of that size. How do you do it? 
you know, safely. How do you do it um, that doesn't interfere with fish migration? Um, you, know, you have fish coming upstream in the spring, going back downstream in the fall. You have resident fish. You know, how, you know the removal of the dam. You know, after the breach was a pretty messy, you know, process. Uh, the river was closed, and that that upset a lot of people. You know, while that work was going on, but it got done. You know, you had a short-term environmental impact for a long-term environmental benefit. What were some of the most complex issues uh, getting that we haven't talked about? getting to the point where it's going to be breached and the dynamite is going to breach it. Were there other things that would be important to report? History. History. Um, there had to be documentation of the Embry Dam and the Crib Dam behind it, extensive documentation, and a process where we consulted with local historians, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. We signed an environmental document with the state agency, with Stafford County, with the city of Fredericksburg, to leave parts of its history there for people to understand that it was there. Uh, Section 106, the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, I can't underscore enough how important it is to, to, to reach out and find people who know something about the history so you can preserve a little bit of the history. That process was, was pretty complicated. Um, one of the Benefits removing the dam that we didn't realize was uh, the, the Ballard's Mill on the other side of the river, a, a, a race made of stone that no one had thought of before that was used you know, in the 1700s as a head race to bring water to uh, turn a wheel that stamped out um, machine parts for guns. I mean, this, there's a wall out in the river that nobody ever saw, uh, which you know adds to the fabric of interpretation of this region and how important it is, but uh, uh, mainly uh, dealing with um, imagined and, and, and other issues that had merit, all of that comes together with meetings, discussions, uh, listening to people, uh, media, you know, it, questions and answers. There was a long process of that before the Embry Dam project really, really got off the ground and really happened. Who were some of the people you remember being um, good to work with, strong advocates, um, leading up to, um, the, I mean, through the permitting process mm -hmm. and the years of work it took to get to the point of the reach? Well, um, initially, John Tippett with Friends of the Rappahannock. Uh, there were some members of Friends of the Rappahannock back then that kind of pushed the ball. Uh, there was uh, State Senator Ed Houck, like I mentioned before, councilmen uh, who were on council at the time for the city of Fredericksburg, Gordon Shelton. Um, he, he, uh, he was most concerned about removing the dam and leaving some of the history. Okay, um, There were people with the American Rivers Association I worked with uh, who had a stake in seeing the dam removed for fisheries, primarily. Uh, the American Canoe Association. I mean, it, the, <laughs> the list of groups came came fast and furious from out of nowhere because this this project got on the radar nationally. This was a national event during the breach, but but it took all the different groups coming together, you know, pushing and, and meeting and, and getting things going. You know, finally, getting, getting everything signed off. But the individuals were Actually, to my memory, very few. You know, I could probably think of five individuals that really pushed for the removal of the Embry Dam and really got the council members to sit down with the court and really got some documentation going and studies going, you know, and um, uh, resolutions passed at the state level, the federal level to make it happen. But, uh, but once it got steam of its own. It was a process you know, that no one could stop because everybody wanted to see it happen. I mean, I can't remember one opponent for the removal of the Embry Dam. Everybody wanted to see it done. Uh, it was a good thing. And uh, so, and that, and that uh, effect, it was easy once things kind of 
kind of got going. It was a, it was a project whose time has come, and uh, it just got you know done. But it took about twenty years, really, of of meetings, questions, media uh, efforts that started and then sputtered and ended, and there'd be a year or two that goes by, and then um, similar to another project I worked with. Um, called the Crow's Nest Natural Area Preserve in Stafford County. Um, my favorite place to go canoeing since the 80s. And one day realizing that there's a five square mile area that nobody lives on. It's a peninsula that's surrounded on three sides by water. Not a single structure on there. You know, just complete, some of the biggest trees in Virginia. And the more I began to explore that property, the more I became convinced that there could be um, uh, sizable communities support to preserve the Crow's Nest Natural Area, which it is today. It's Crow's Nest Natural Area Preserve. At the time, it was just Crow's Nest. It was private property. The caretaker of the property gave me the keys to the gate. I'd go in on Fridays, and I wouldn't come out until Sunday. You know, I, I got to meet the landowner, you know, and uh, got a project off the ground with the uh, Regional Airport Commission to preserve some land in Crow's Nest to develop an airport impact some wetlands to mitigate by buying 10 acres at a 10 to 1 ratio, 70 acres. Seven acres of impact, 10 to 1, 70 acres of preservation, 7 and 70, 10 to 1. Uh, that was the first brick in the wall to preserve all of Crow's Nest. As the state uh, Department of Natural Resources began coming down doing surveys and finding that there was amazing uh, biological uh, qualities that Crow's Nest had. And, Seeing that project finally be protected and preserved, to, it was like Embry Dam, where it was kind of like that dream out there that you wish and hope for. But who do you talk to? You, know, you get the trust for public land involved. You know, you get um, the Department of Conservation involved. You you get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency. They came down. They wanted to make it into a national wildlife refuge, but the funding sputtered. That kind of died on the vine. And then another group came in, you know, and picked it up where we left off and finally with a patchwork of monies Crow's Nest got bought and protected. It's a natural area. Um, that project more than any other thing I've ever worked on um, I feel is my legacy that I can tell my grandson. Something that I feel I had a hand in. Of course I didn't buy it myself you know but I've taken hundreds and hundreds of people out there by boat. My wife used to ask me, why are you taking so many people out there? You're spending all your time and your money on transportation. But that, but you know, there might be somebody along the way who could write a letter to their congressman and tell them why this area is so important. Until we found the right funding agencies to, to come out and discover it and, and decide that they see this as fitting their mission. The, the Nature Conservancy came in, you know. Um, the um, uh, the Virginia Department of Natural Heritage, they convinced their agency that there's extraordinary biological attributes in Crow's Nest. We need to buy this and protect it. But they needed money from five sources to put together enough money to buy it, to do you know, the fair market appraisals, find out what that magic number was. Stafford County signed a contract. They purchased it with the help of the state and other funds to make it a national, uh, a, a natural area preserve. So, uh, uh, but it goes back to the same principles with working like with Embry Dam. You got a big project, you know. You need to find out who the decision makers are. You need to find out if the local population supports it. You need to find out if there's worth. What is the worth in doing this to the environment? And then you know, seeking out the funding to do this to make it happen. Getting everybody on board. It doesn't happen overnight, and the Crow's Nest project, like the Embry Dam project, at times it felt like a roller coaster, up and down and up and down. You know, the the, the, the newspaper have a story about Crow's Nest finally preserved, but the deal falls through. You know, so you know you form the trust for Crow's Nest. You know, and you you meet and you and you find uh, uh, monies to get a lobbyist to 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 get the Congress down here. You know, get get uh, Congresswoman Joanne Davis down here to see Crow's Nest for herself to understand why we want to protect this place. That's something that I did outside of my work. 
that I feel that I'm uh, very, very proud of. You know that that uh, I put my effort into something that actually came to fruition. You know that I I can go out there now and lead groups and show them. You know some some natural wonders. You know of, of our little universe here in Fredericksburg. Uh, if if you look at a satellite map, of Chesapeake Bay. You know done in uh, you know colors. The last big chunk of green left is crow's nest. You know, it's right there. It's a big green chunk of land that hasn't been farmed or developed or clear cut down to the ground. You know, it's going to be there forever beyond me. So it it would seem like the the the, the great effort of our life should be to involve ourselves in an effort that outlives our life. Because we're just here. We're just temporary, but we can do something that has benefits for uh, future generations. That is to be the ultimate goal in life, to have that. Okay, part of what I'm curious about is that I can hear how we as a citizen is a strong advocate of environmental preservation. Mm -hmm. And the Army Corps of Engineers was shifting in that direction during yes, his career. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. 10 years ago, the Corps would say that we are not for or against environmental preservation. If you ask them that, any any member of regulatory who I work with, 40 plus people, they'll say that we do stand for protecting the environment. You know, but we'll work with the public, you know, to find a way that they can do their project to have as minimal impact on the environment. Uh, so I got lucky to find myself in a in a field office, I, I didn't just happen there, I had to work for that. But once I got in the field office, there were projects bigger than me I had to deal with. And I mean, we didn't have internet, you know, we didn't have, it was just me, you know. And so that forced me to um, look beyond myself and have faith that if you keep at it, you keep working it, you, you'll find a way, like anything in life. If you want it bad enough, it'll happen. But what I didn't know is that the area that I found myself in happens to be, you know, the most fantastic place one could live in terms of its natural resources. Every Sunday I go out canoeing on a different stream or river, you know, with my friends. We have a group we go out. Uh, you're hard pressed to find other places to do that, to escape in the outdoors. What I didn't know is that this area had a had a great amount of historic properties rare species, the natural areas that are untouched, a few of them, you know. I didn't know that. And I didn't know the rate of development was so prevalent, you know, in, 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 the, in the, the suburbanization in particular of Spotsylvania County, Stafford County. The, the, you know, those were two counties that had me hopping every minute, you know, and I, and I couldn't sleep at night. I mean, I'd, I'd be reading development plans, circling with a red ink pen. This can't happen. You know, they're not going to destroy the stream, you know. but. You, but you get up the next day and you work at it. You make the phone calls. And you engage people, much like um, you know Nancy engaged me and Jess engaged me. You know, um, you explain your purpose and your need. Uh, uh, I'll help you any way I can. You know, <laughs> in my own little way. Um, uh, you know, uh, I begin to realize that it's really true. You can think globally, cosmically, think about your your world, but you can act locally. You know, you can. You can make a profound difference locally, uh, but probably the best thing that I've ever done that I feel the most proud of, just protecting dirt, land, water, is working with young people. Interns have come through me. I've gotten them started. I've given them a little bit of what I have, my knowledge, a little bit of what I have, the contagion, you know, to go out there and protect the environment. You protect by working with people, you know, finding a way. Um, that that's a, a kind of a generative thing with me that these are like my children that they go on they, they carry the mantle uh, they see how important it is and they make an impact in their regions of the country and I hear from them all of them um, and it's 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 amazing to see that because um, you know you you can't protect something unless you love it you can't love it unless you know about it and been given the knowledge of how important it is. So you learn about it. You learn who's going to teach you that. 
It's going to show you your, your way to, to see how important that is and why it's important. Why that's important over there more than that over there. Um, those are decisions we all have to deal with if we're going to live on this planet. But planning is the key. You know, planning is the key. And um, where the environment is concerned, you have to have to tread very carefully and um, make sure that if you make decisions, uh, they're not contrary to the public interest, as we call it. Or it's not going to hurt somebody. It's not going to hurt an animal. It's not going to hurt a plant. Um, you can't guarantee all that, but you have to make the best informed decision you have at the time. From my understanding with a government agency like uh, the Army Corps of Engineers or any government agency, mm -hmm. things change as the administrations change. That's right. Uh, if my math is correct, you worked at least under four different presidential administrations. Mm -hmm. What were some of the changes you observed um, from George H.W. to President Clinton to George W. and um, the President Obama. Oh, um, that's a lot to ask. I mean, yeah. Um, well, I didn't. I didn't like it uh, the first couple of years of my job position to find out that our uh, manual for defining wetlands was thrown out the window, and nothing could be a wetland anymore. <laughs> uh, that made me want to go jump off the I ninety five bridge, you know, but. Um, but there, but the government and the and the way it changes, it changes very slowly. Uh, the 1989 Wetland Delineation Manual that was forged by five agencies was written out of law. There are no more wetlands. But the Corps of Engineers fell back on its 1987 Wetland Delineation Manual. For this reason, made a lot of sense. And um, under George Bush, again, there was another manual that would have eliminated wetlands. It just seems that. All of these threats from different administrations, there's a lot of bluster, there's a lot of threats, there's a lot of um, uh, really weird things you see come through Congress, federal appropriations that zero out the Clean Water Act, you know. But none of them stand a lot of day. You know, they're going to get a veto or they're going to get a, a Senate look, you know. And it always seems that the Congress is going to try something every year, you know, that's going to be. Uh, deleterious to the environment, but but we have checks and balances in the government that keep things strong. And what I have found is that there have been adjustments and there's been a pendulum. The pendulum can swing really far to the right, which means that you know you have to be a little more respectful of the landowner. But then the pendulum the next year can swing really far to the left, which means you really have to just close the door on environmental impacts. But somewhere down the middle, you know, there's a way to approach it, where nothing changes, you know, if you if 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 the public uh, wants to see the environment protected, it will be protected, and I don't see that changing from now into the next foreseeable future because it um, the government has a lot of different parts that move together, and uh, the media picks up on the most controversial parts, uh, but. Uh, Sometimes it feels like you're flying through flak, you know, that you're trying to navigate your plane and flak hits and you go a little bit this way, a little bit that way. But in, but in balance, you know, you things don't change a whole lot. I haven't seen that. I've seen the regulations change a little bit here and there. But I feel very strong about the, 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 the future of the regulatory program. And... Um, where it began, how it began, you know, where we are today. It could always be improved. Um, but uh, as much as I feared waking up one day with no job and nothing to do, it never happened. You know, um, I've had people tell me that they thought the Clean Water Act ended 20 years ago. I mean, uh, no, no, there's still people going to court being charged with wetland violations who step over the line. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it, talking about, you know, politics and the way regulations and law changes uh, didn't really affect my work by and large over the two and a half decades in the Corps. 
every day there's a new challenge, there's a new way to approach environmental regulation. The, the, the law is still the law. The regulations are still the regulations. The little, little tweaks, little tweaks, there's been little tweaks, but but it's still the same. You know, Someone has a wetland, you know, they want to destroy it, and you just say, let's find another way. You know, and that's what we're tasked to do. That's all I've been asked to do. That's the only thing that I feel I was good at with the Corps is being able to talk to people and engage them, show them the science, you know, show them why it's important to protect that wetland, make them feel they own a little piece of the Clean Water Act, and everybody's being treated equally. Uh, there's a development out here called Fawn Lake, and um, there's deed restrictions on wetlands throughout that entire 2,000 acre development. Uh, people who buy lots, they can't fill the wetlands in back. You know, they find out about the wetlands, they call me, you know, what does it mean? I explain it to them. You know, those wetlands are intact, you know. There's deed restrictions on projects all over this region that came from reviewing an initial project. The developer wants to build a road into the development. They cross a stream. They need a permit. They need to put utility service through. Uh, they're going to get permits, but they protect everything else, the balance of that. Uh, to a homeowner who moves in, they don't know all this has happened. All they know is they bought a lot that had a deed restriction on it. Well, that was put there by the developer to assist in getting his permit from the court for those small impacts. How would you describe uh, the removal of the dam after it was breached? I mean, would, was it relatively straightforward because it had been planned, or were there things that came up? Was still physically removing parts of the dam. Yeah, uh, when the dam was, well, there was three parts. There was the 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 uh, excavation of material behind the dam, and the disposal and upland containment. Then there was the breach, followed by the deconstruction and removal of the dam. And one would say there was a fourth part of that, and that's where a little sliver of land was left that maybe should have been dredged. The Corps came back and dredged that. It was about 20,000 cubic yards. Um, the game department uh, has information they've given me to show that the fishery resource has been restored to a large extent upriver. That has not been there historically for over 150 years. That's very important. That's, that's data that I have. I have here with me. I saw this morning. I wanted to get a little prepared. I knew you'd ask the question. What a lot, what the public doesn't see a lot is measurements taken by agencies of the water column. What's in it? How is it improved? Fisheries, and it's tremendous, tremendously. Uh, but what the public does see physically again is the silt, right? But I would never, ever, ever say that the removal of the dam wasn't worth it because the silt has been there since years before the removal of the dam. I know this. I've been in the region long enough. I, ha I found those articles. You know, I spent a lot of time cutting articles out and making these really nice tableau that I scan and make PDF files. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles that I have archived of my work to include, you know, probably several hundred of the Embry Dam project. And I've got stories of the silt before the dam was ever breached. But what has gotten in the media, you know, is that there's silt now behind the dam. It has gone down the river, you know. There's no mention of the dredge work that was done to remove the sediment before the breach. Because it's hard for the average person to follow all that history. Uh, so, in my own mind, I feel that uh, the removal of the dam is one of the great things that that has happened in this region. And it happened with everyone getting behind it to see it happen. Okay. Well, I think we're coming up on time. All right. Um, and, you know, I have a sneaking suspicion this isn't going to be a last interview. All right. Um, so I'm not going to ask my traditional last question, but is there anything, you know, in terms of it's coming to mind. It's an important part of the story of the Embry Dam removal um, that we didn't talk about today. That um, we'd like to well, make sure we, you know, we record right now. 
Um, not really. I think that um, there's information that I've witnessed, that I've given you, but I also have a book that I've uh, taken together to create um, about the history of dam building on the Rappahannock. What a lot of people don't realize is the Rappahannock Navigational Canal System that ran from Fredericksburg upriver for 53 miles. There were dozens of small dams along the Rappahannock that fed water into raceways for boats to come down. Um, it's just another facet of the Rappahannock that you can see visually. It's pretty powerful. Uh, and the Rappahannock uh, being dammed at Fredericksburg was another component of that because the original crib dam gave water to the Rappahannock Canal that Bateau could go down. It's still right out here. It later became uh, the water supply canal for the city of Fredericksburg, their intake. Uh, but, but just that there's so much history right here where we're sitting in Fredericksburg on this property, Fall Hill. It's no coincidence that, you know, Friends of the Rappahannock is on property that is extremely historic. I'm writing about Fall Hill. I'm doing a chronology and getting some anecdotal stories. How did this building get to be here? You know, uh, that's a story in itself. How did the Friends of the Rappahannock become my landlord here? You know, that's a story. Why am I here? You know, and who owned Fall Hill? You know, uh, who was uh, who was uh, Francis Thornton, who came to Fredericksburg in the 1740s and built the mill? Um, you know, who is uh, Butler Franklin Thornton? Uh, does anybody remember her? I do. In my gallery next door, I've got a photo of her on the wall. She used to meet with me and give me lemonade and tell me stories about Katina, the Indian girl who lived here. Her ghost still resides. Francis Thornton's hand servant. You know, I mean, there's lots of little stories to go into creating the 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 the, the interconnectedness of this region right here. That I just feel lucky to be alive and live through this period, and will live out my days hopefully right here, where uh, where my son and I came to look for a Boy Scout project 30 years ago. Okay, that so it's gone full circle. I stumbled down here, met a man named Bill Mix, uh, started uh, paddling, started seeing things, uh, and, it, and it contributed to me understanding how important the Rappahannock is for our region. Thank you.